Hello there, Rider Flex Nation. Steve Urban here with more career advice and job interviewing tips for you. And as a quick reminder, if you enjoy our podcast, please remember to subscribe to our channel and like the episodes. And on today's podcast, I have my old friend, Becky Reed, on the phone, the CEO of Lone Star Credit Union down in Dallas, Texas. How you doing, Becky? I'm great, Steve. Uh, so good to talk to you. My gosh, it, it brings back so many memories when I hear your voice back in the old music retail day. <laughs> I know. I always say back in the days of where dinosaurs roamed the earth, right? Because a lot of kids these days, they don't know what a record store was. Right? I mean, right? They, I don't, they, seriously, a, a typical senior in high school today probably doesn't even realize you used to have to go to this this brick and mortar location to buy a record. <laughs> no, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. And I mean, and tapes, especially. I mean, who, I mean, tapes, what? Right. We're giving away our age on this podcast already. I know. I uh, know. <laughs> those are some good times. I have to, uh, you know, all the things you've been successful at, and I, I don't know how you feel, but all the things I've done professionally over the years, I don't think I ever had a more fun time than working in music retail. That was a blast. Oh, it was great. And I think I think we were really lucky too, Steve, because that particular company, Camelot Music, um, I mean, they had their stuff together. I mean, they had a management training program. They really cared about culture. They right. they um, impressed upon us uh, to be leaders, not just managers. They shared with us the financials, so we understood EBITDA and that kind of thing. So right. not many yep. retail companies do that. So I feel like we, we really got off on the right foot and um, working yeah. for that company. Totally agree. Their culture was awesome. And so, so tell us, yeah, tell us about yourself. Give the listeners kind of a, a Becky overview. We already told them that you worked in music retail early, but kind of give them the, the Becky overview and then maybe a little bit about a Lone Star Credit Union. Okay, so at, from a very young age, uh, I was always put in positions of leadership, and most of that had to do with I'm a very confident person, and I'm very decisive, uh, and I, I get along with people fairly well, so every place that I would go, I was very reliable. I would get put in charge of departments or people or whatever. And um, so I really enjoyed doing that. So as you know, you and I both worked for Camelot Music. So I went into retail yep. pretty much right out of high school. I uh, worked there for eight or nine years and decided that the retail hours was probably uh, <laughs> something I was uh, tired of. Um, right. Having to work six days a week and not really having weekends and holidays and evenings and things like that to myself, mm -hmm. I decided, wow, the banking world, I mean, who doesn't want bankers hours, right? <laughs> right. So, especially, especially yeah, ask me how many hours I'm working now. <laughs> right, right. Yes, much better. Anyway, yeah. So, um, so, I I had heard of credit unions, but really what I wanted to do, now I was a, a store manager and I also was kind of an area manager with Camelot. So I did supervise other managers. And so I went into the the banking world, understanding that I probably was going to have to start over. And so I started applying for jobs as a teller. And uh, I didn't get the jobs because I didn't have cash handling experience, even though I had eight years of management experience. Well, I didn't have any cash handling. They must have forgot about all the cash you counted at Camp with Music because back, back <laughs> when we you. worked there, it was cash, not credit cards. That's correct. It was. Yep. Yep. Yes. Um, so but I didn't meet that requirement to their specifications. So uh, I actually interviewed at a credit union and they said, you know what? You really are overqualified to be a teller, but we have this financial service officer position available. We're building a new branch. Would you like to do that? So absolutely. Sure. I'm, I can do customer service. I'm good. So that was uh, when I started in the credit union business. I knew a little bit about credit unions. My uh, parents were members of a credit union because my dad was an air traffic controller and so they had a credit union for government employees. And so I knew about credit unions, but I certainly didn't know about the world that has been opened up to me uh, since then. Right. And uh, it's a great, a great industry and uh, not for profit choice uh, in the banking industry. Um, and, uh, and I love it. Absolutely love it. 
Congratulations on your success there. And and since so you you started there and then moved up quickly, got promoted a few times over the years. Uh, and then um, I think was it last year or has it been a year and a half? You, you, how long have you been in the CEO position? So actually, the CEO position, I, I think officially uh, three months. Oh, oh okay. perfect. <laughs> Perfect, perfect, but, perfect segue. <laughs> but I was a CEO at a, a credit union previous uh, to Lone Star. I actually came to Lone Star in 2014. Um, I did a short stint in uh, the cold white north of the panhandle of Nebraska uh, oh. for a period of time. Um, and so I was a CEO, uh, moved back to Texas, um, and cause this is where I'm from, and uh I took over here at Lone Star as the chief operating officer, and then I moved into the chief information officer as well, uh, and then now uh, CEO. Well, congratulations on, on your success there. I'm not surprised at all. You've always been such a great leader and, and great with people and great at operations. Can you, can you just speak to, uh, uh, you know, what it's like to transition into the C level? You know, for those folks that, you know, want to be a CEO someday, maybe they're at the manager level, maybe they're at the director level. Just, just talk to the listeners a little bit about what it's like to, to go into the C level for the first time. So I think, um, and that's a great question, and I think what happens most of the time and what most people don't really think about it is they think that when you're in the C-suite, you sit in your office and you really don't do anything. Right? <laughs> right. Um, uh. And uh, because no longer are you doing the day-to-day tasks, the, um, the, the physical types of things that people usually see uh, when you're in a a more frontline position. So when you're an executive, you really have to change your mindset to think from a strategic level. So you almost have to go from, uh, if you're a department manager, for example, you're thinking about your department, right? You're very focused on the people in your department. You're very focused on your department numbers. You're focused on that one thing. And that is your whole world. But as an executive, you have to elevate your perspective to kind of that 30,000 foot view where now I'm thinking about the entire organization and how each department fits into the organization as a whole. And my job as an executive, regardless of if you're the chief executive or the chief operating officer or chief financial officer, you are really thinking from a, a high level perspective. And it's your job to make sure that you're steering the ship into the future. So you constantly have to be on the lookout for what what trends are in the industry, what's happening in the industry, what might be coming uh, for your company in six months from now, um, and, and constantly doing that strategic uh, thinking and making that that switch, that mindset switch that I'm no longer thinking about the day-to-day success of, of myself or my department right. to thinking of, I have to think about the success of the organization as a whole. Mm-hmm. That really is a shift in mindset that that's hard um, to, to do. And so I'm a big Star Trek fan. I don't know if you know that, but I did not. As a matter of um, fact, I do remember that. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that hasn't changed. So um, there, there's a, a line that Spock says in the original series. And what he says is the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few mm-hmm. or the one. Right. And, and what you have to do as an executive, take yourself out of that piece, your needs no longer matter. The needs of the company and the needs of everybody in the company matter. So when you have to make tough decisions, you have to remember that you're doing it for the entire company. Mm. And and that's what you're doing whenever you're sitting in the corner office. It is so true. And and people don't realize how stressful that can be, right? The amount of stress stress and pressure uh, that, that gets poured down on, on a CEO, it's really hard to describe until you actually set in the captain's chair. And you realize, like you said, you're making decisions for everybody and that's weighing on you constantly, right? Well, and you get... And- and I don't want to say you get no thanks for it, but but at the end of the day, I mean, we don't do this to, to get praise. I mean, that, right. that's not why you're here. If that's what you want, you probably need to be doing something else. Right. But um, but whenever you're you're thinking from a chief executive level, especially. So when you're a CEO, there isn't anybody in the organization that has your perspective. Right. And you see 
everything. And lots of other people in the organization can criticize your thought process Mm -hmm. or uh, the decisions you make, but they don't have all the information. Even other executives don't have all of the information all of the time. And so you kind of have to think, I I have to make the best decision that I can with the information I have today. Mm -hmm. And People are going to criticize it. It might be the wrong decision tomorrow, but I'm going to have to make it because it's it's the best thing I can do right now. Right. And understanding that I'm affecting the lives of every employee who works here, you know, that's, yes, that's taxing and stressful. <laughs> it sure can be. I always tell people it's a cold and lonely uh, uh, space in, in the corner of the building in that CEO chair sometimes, for sure. Um, if people ask me this question, you know, once I got to the C-level spot, uh, I, and, I, and I can't remember at what age, I think I was, oh gosh, I should know the answer to this, but uh, I think late 30s, early 40s, early 40s, I think I, once I got to the COO spot, uh, you know, people would say, well, oh, gosh, you know, how'd you get there? How'd you do that? How, how do you, how do you get to this, this level? How'd you get promoted? You know, kind of the, how, how'd you get there question? How, I know how I kind of answered that. How would you answer that question? How do you get there? Serving others. There's really, um, you have to put yourself by the wayside and think about what's best for others. So I really believe that, um, that we're all given gifts, right? And the gifts that that we have are to help our fellow man. And if you can help other people, regardless of of what that is, if you're helping them understand something better or feel better about a certain situation or you're helping them make a decision, uh, whatever that is, um, I feel like that is, is what I was put here to do. And so by serving others and, and, working with people, uh, that, that's how I got promoted. And I can't, and it's one of those things where, I mean, I'm sitting there going, what, what? I got promoted. I got promoted again. I got promoted (laughs) again. What? They want me to do this. I mean, really? Because I mean, I'm just, I'm just doing my job. (laughs) I'm just trying to, to do the best that I can. And, um, I know I've heard on, on one of your other podcasts talk about purpose, right? And, Mm -hmm. um, and do you have a purpose statement? And, and I do have a purpose statement and I have had one for a long time and that really guides, it guides my decisions every day. And, and it's, it's cliche. It's my purpose is to make a difference. That's That's it. That's That's all I strive to do every day. And so because of that, I've, I mean, I got to the C-suite. I, right, right. And you're, so. you know, you're, you're right. If you, if you just focus on helping people and helping teams and just doing the right thing to help people, uh, you'll, you'll just constantly get promoted most of the time. If you, if you're working hard and you're helping people, uh, you, you'll have opportunities in life. So if, if being a C-level executive wasn't stressful enough already, you also decided <laughs> to, uh, step into the startup world. Uh, and, and I, I believe you are co-founder of Pure IT Credit Union Services. And yes. so you, you just thought you'd pour a little extra stress on your life, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> tell us, you know. Tell us about that. <laughs> so that's an interesting uh, story, but at the heart of it, Steve, is service again. Gotcha. So, so here at my credit union, we were having technology struggles, and I was frustrated. Um, because the people that I supervised, the tools that they needed to do their job weren't functioning properly. And so I, I was causing a ruckus, right, at the, in the executive room saying, look, we got to get this fixed. And the person who was the chief technology officer at the time, who just happened to be our CFO, he was like, I really don't know what we need to fix. So we hired somebody to come in and tell us, and it was a disaster. They didn't give us the information we needed. And so I actually called one of our former past live coworkers from Camelot Music, I knew he had a technology company. And I said, hey, Jack, can you come in here and help me? I trust you. I know you're going to tell me the truth. I've just spent a lot of money bringing a consultant in that didn't give us any answers. Can you help me? And he said, absolutely, I can help you. So he came out. They did an assessment. And uh, it just made a world of difference uh, for the credit union. And after going through that process with him and having – uh, worked with him uh, through that, I said, you know what? There is nobody in the credit union industry that's 
does what you have done for me. I see. So why can you help other credit unions? And he said, well, yeah, let let me go see if I can find some VC money to grow my company. And I said, no, 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 no. (laughs) Let me invest in you. (laughs) And me, meaning Lone Star Credit Union, let Lone Star Credit Union invest in you because we are allowed to own for-profit companies as long as they help other credit unions. I see. So I can't go buy businesses that, that, you know, I can't go buy a music store business, for example. I don't know who would want to do that these days, but, um, uh, but I, I can't do that as a credit union, but I can invest in a company that helps other credit unions. And so it, it all started uh, with that. I knew that they, the industry needed, their expertise. Yep, there was a need, and that's how it happens so often. Somebody, somebody sees a need, or they they see a lack of service or a lack of quality, and they think to themselves, "Man, I, surely I can do that better." And uh, that sounds like that's exactly what you've done. By the way, the other thing there for the listeners, in case they didn't pick up on it, and I and I really stress this all the time. Life is so much about reputation and relationships that you build over time, right? I mean, you talked about Jack uh, and how, you know, you he was somebody from your past. And you knew him. You knew his work ethic. You knew his people skills. You knew his abilities. You trusted that relationship. And th- and now you guys have, have, have partnered on this startup. And it's just so important. I just really emphasize that so often in the podcasts. You can be a hard worker. That's great because that's a huge part of it. You can be really smart and have a high IQ. That's great. But if you don't have the right people skills and you don't build relationships over time, you're not going to be successful. And and I just really stress that. That was a perfect example when you mentioned Jack. Well, and you never know, Steve, because um, right. I I – so I have an executive level position coming up um, in 2019 that I'll be hiring for. And and I'm reaching out to people that were I worked with at other credit unions right. who may have been my superior at the time. Right. Exactly. Or my subordinate at the time. And, and I'm able to give them an opportunity now, but I certainly wouldn't be reaching out to them if they treated me poorly right. or – you know, didn't have a good relationship with me at the time. Mm-hmm. Totally agree. So with that startup, kind of finishing that piece off, is there a, is there one or two pieces of advice you would give somebody thinking of or thinking about starting their own business? Any any key pointers there? Well, I think it would be the same as what most other people uh, would say, but it's a lot of work. <laughs> and um, it is. It requires probably a lot more money than you think it does mm. uh, or you think it will. Um, I, I think, and you have to be prepared for that. So you've got to be looking at your forecast. You've got to really uh, pay attention to what's going to look like in the future. Do you have enough working capital to do what you think that you need to do? And when should you hire people? You know, where's that, that breaking point? You know, when service is, is important and, uh, also, the bottom line, it, it's a it's a lot of hard work, but gosh, <laughs> it is a lot of fun. It is so much fun, and helping other credit unions and seeing Peer IT grow, and, and seeing Jack and Stacy and Trent and the folks over there be successful is just so rewarding. Mm. So I would absolutely do it again in a heartbeat, but just be prepared for a lot of work. Mm, That's great stuff. That's great stuff. Thank you for sharing that. Becky, moving into, you know, on this podcast, we do a lot of not only career advice, but job interviewing tips. You have been interviewing people as long as I have. Uh, We we won't mention what year we started, but (laughs) people, people for a long time. Um, Are there a couple of, of favorite interview questions you like to ask? There are. Uh, I always tend to focus on situational type questions. I mean, I can look at their resume and see what they've done in their career. Uh, So I ask them things like, tell me about a time when dot, 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 uh, Mm. when you didn't get along with your boss. Mm -hmm. What did you do when you disagreed with a decision a coworker made? What did you do? How did you handle a situation where you had to step up and go outside of your role and do something different? So I ask those kinds of questions to try to determine a person's character because at the end of the day, I can see their skills, 
their knowledge and their abilities right it generally pretty quickly. Um, what I can't see in a resume uh, and even sometimes in just a, a superficial interview is what is their actual character? What are they going to bring to the credit union or the position that they're in? Um, and so I ask a lot of questions like that. That is, man, that's great, Becky. You're right. Situa situational questions. I love how you, you kind of framed that. Situational questions, I think. That's key, right? It, it shows their ability for judgment and decision making and all kinds of stuff. Love that. Um, these days, as you interview people, and I think it's, it, it's changed, I think, over the years. What, what common mistakes do you see now or, you know, when when people come into your office on a pretty routine basis, what are you seeing? Common mistakes from from candidates that are interviewing for a job. I think what I see most of the time that is a little bit of a um, I'm going to call it a turn off or, or just that moment in the interview when you go, OK, uh, this is probably not going to work out is when you get somebody who like I, as a matter of fact, I just interviewed somebody the other day and he was talking so much mm. and he he really felt like he was interviewing us, which is perfectly okay. I want people to interview us so that they understand our culture too. That's okay. But he would say things like, well, is all right if I ask a question? And he didn't even take a breath. He mm. just started into his question. Oh, wow. um, and he didn't let, he didn't really even let us talk. He talked for an hour <laughs> and we didn't even ask any questions and so it's one of those kinds of things it's like all right so is that somebody who's either hyper excited and just wants to get it all out which okay that's one thing or is that somebody who's going to come in here and try to domineer because we're very collaborative we have we have got to work as a team there's right. nobody here who knows everything including myself mm -hmm. and so we've got to work together we're better together and so is this going to be someone who's going to come in here and just take over everything and not listen <laughs> right I, I think that that's probably the biggest and you can tell when somebody's nervous and it's okay when somebody's nervous with everybody gets nervous but when they just don't stop talking right yeah that usually is a, I, is a sign yeah the other thing i think that's tied to that that candidates need to understand is there there's a there's questions you want to ask there are things you need to ask that you're planning on asking right and if they just talk way too long when they're giving answers to the first couple of questions, you don't have time to, to get right. to the other questions you want to ask. Uh, and I think candidates, they, they, they definitely uh, forget that sometimes. You're right. A lot of it's nerves, but to your point, in, in that case, uh, yeah, kind of a domineering, I need to talk all the time and I don't listen well kind of candidate. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, you've been so successful. I'm so happy for you, by the way, just thinking back about our early careers and where we've come. <laughs> Thank you. Music, music retail, you know, congratulations on everything you've done. What would you say if you had to, you know, pick two or three key contributing factors uh, to your success, what would you say they are? From a very early age, and this came from my father. So my father has always endeavored to be fair. And when we were growing up, that was a common theme. Uh, in our lives was fairness. So, for example, if we would get in trouble for something uh, after we took our punishment, whatever that was, and, you know, we'd be crying or whatever in our room, sulking, and he would always come and he'd go, I, I want you to understand why you were punished so that you, you can understand where I'm coming from and the reason I needed to punish you for doing whatever. And that has really stuck with me. And so I have always tried to be fair and treat other people the way that I want to be treated. And because of that, again, uh, people want to work with me. And when people want to work with you, you tend to get promoted. So it, it wasn't like I set out to constantly get promoted, but that's how it worked because people wanted to work for me and with me. Mm. And uh, so I think that those principles that I learned early on from my dad is uh, and, and what still continues to guide me. 
You know, you touched on something there that I think is key. Great leaders want to be followed. The, the people don't have to follow them. They want to follow them. And I think that's that's absolutely key. I'm glad you brought that up. Just two more questions here. I know we're almost out of time. What, what would you say your Super Bowl moment is so far? Uh, and you've had a few here, but I guess if you had to pick one, what's the what's your what's your huge trophy moment for you so far professionally? So um, my Super Bowl moment, and actually it's not a professional accomplishment; it's a personal accomplishment, and it's my son. Great. Um, he Great. is an amazing, well-adjusted person, and uh, I am so proud to have been able to, to raise him and, and put him out into the world to where he can be a benefit to others. So how, that's how, my Super Bowl moment. Thank you for sharing that. How old is he now? He's 20. He's 20. Isn't that um, so rewarding when you watch a 21 year old young adult carry themselves uh, visiting with other people and you're, you're standing nearby listening. That That's really heartwarming, isn't it? It feels good. It feels good. <laughs> I can't, I, I can't, Yes, it, it's not something you can really put into words. Right. Um, and he's right. he's such a wonderful young man, and and it's it's good to know that I I I was a part of raising him. So he's That's he's a fabulous great. young man. Last question: um, If you could look back on that twenty-one-year-old self and talk to her <laughs> today, what 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 would you say to that young lady today if you could go back? Okay, so. I never, ever thought I was good at anything. And uh, I would tell myself to, first of all, slow down and don't be in such a hurry. Mm. Uh, Things will come. You don't have to make everything happen. And second of all, you really are good at what you do. And what I loved to do always was lead people. But I was so afraid to say out loud that that's what I wanted because I felt like that was selfish. Gotcha. Um, saying that I wanted to be a leader implied that I thought I was a good leader and therefore I didn't want people to think that I was um, bragging or, or a braggadocious person. Right. Um, and so I never said it out loud and not until I was in my forties. And um, uh, I would tell my 21 year old self, hone that skill, focus on it, pay attention, listen, because uh, you really are a good leader. Mm. Becky, thank you so much for sharing that. I, I could talk to you for another three hours. And by the way, <laughs> I, if we were at happy hour, we could we could tell each other a bunch of stories about those old music for sure. days. The, those are good. Thank, yes. you, thank you so much for calling in. I really appreciate it. Um, you've been awesome and, uh, I hope to uh, catch up again soon. Okay. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you, Steve. Okay. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. And there folks is your writer flex tip of the day from my old friend, Becky Reed down in Dallas, Texas. We truly hope you find our material helpful and entertaining. And in the spirit of giving back, RiderFlex donates half of all proceeds gained from this podcast to the Volunteers of America and their efforts to support veterans with employment services. You can become a supporter of this podcast, by the way, by visiting Anchor FM. That's anchor.fm slash RiderFlex. And as always, you can send us your questions or suggested topics and we'll help in any way we can. Our email is podcast at riderflex.com or drop us a voicemail at 888-964-5876 extension 710. Visit riderflex.com to learn more about us. Thanks so much for listening, folks, and have a wonderful day.